Hello, I am John McCooch for WSOU News, joined alongside Nelson DeMille to discuss his newest entry into the John Corey series, The Maze. But first of all, Nelson, how are we doing today? Doing pretty good today. All right, so tell us about this story that you've worked on and what it's all about. Yeah, well, uh, the name of the book is The Maze, and um, it's got two meanings. Uh, there's a physical maze in the book, and also the maze of uh, corruption uh, on a government level, on a police level. And uh, this book is about, actually, the uh, Gilgo Beach murders, which you may have heard of, but kind of made national news. About 11 years ago, there were 10 prostitutes found in the Bramble along um, Gilgo Beach on Long Island, near the Hamptons and near Fire Island. And uh, this is still a non-soft crime. Uh, 10, 10 murders, the police are stymied. It's not a cold case. They're still working on it. And so this kind of inspired me as a Long Islander to fictionalize it um, and uh, kind of look at it uh, in a different way based on a lot of interviews I've had with uh, the Suffolk County police out there and some other homicide people and FBI people. So, you know, it's always tough when you try to fictionalize a real case, but especially a non-solved case. But uh, my character, John Corey, of course, solved the murders. Uh, on the last page of the book. Gotcha. And a lot of those stories that you've written so far throughout your career uh, have to do with the New York area. How important is it for you to have your home state involved in it as someone from uh, Queens? Yeah, yeah. Some of my books uh, have Long Island settings. I think maybe the most uh, uh, popular of all those books is the Gold Coast, set on the Gold Coast of Long Island. Um and uh, that was about 20 years ago, and I've used Long Island as settings, some of my other books, including the Hamptons and New York City, of course. So, uh, you know, in some ways I'm uh, what they call a regional writer, uh, the way other writers have written about either the South or the Wild West or whatever. And it, it, you feel kind of comfortable, like you, you're not a fraud, you know the area, you're not making it all up. Uh, you're basing the story on uh, people, places, and things you know. And that has the, you know, the ring of truth to it. And I think that's why, you know, I, I, I come back to Long Island settings and Long Island uh, locations and incidents when, I, when I'm kind of stymied. Some of my books are set in other places in the world. You know, I traveled to uh, Moscow and Leningrad back in the old days and to Cuba and to Vietnam. And, you know, those are always good action-adventure tales. But eventually I, I do come back to Long Island. So for those that maybe may not be familiar with these stories yet, who is John Corey and what is his motivation? Yeah, John Corey is my uh, uh, my series character. I don't write series books usually. All my books, other than the Corey series, have been standalone. But way back about 20 years ago, I wrote a book called Plum Island starring John Corey, who is very politically incorrect. He's NYPD, but he's convalescing from bullet wounds. And... Um, He's out on the east end of Long Island on the North Fork, and uh, a friend of his is a uh, police uh, sh uh, sheriff. Comes to him and says, we have a, a, a murder here of two Plum Island biologists, and as well, long as you're out here, can you give us a hand? That's how it started. And uh, Plum Island, as you probably know, has always been uh, suspected of being a biological warfare research center although it's under the Department of Agriculture, and I'm supposed to study animal diseases. So it was a good book. It was a great book, actually, and it did very well. It did on the New York Times list for like 18 weeks. Uh, and then I went on to my next book, but the fan mail was so overwhelming about this John Corey book that I decided to write a second and then a third, and now uh, The Maze is number eight in the Corey series. Uh, and, you know, people seem to like the character. People like series. I like to write standalone, but you know, I'll keep going with the series that pays the bills. Okay. Right, then how was the process for kind of going back to the maze? How was the process for writing this one? This is the longest gap that you've had in between these John Corey books, so how was that experience? Yeah, that's a good point. It is the longest gap. Um, you know, I moved to a different publisher, and they weren't you know, maybe keen on picking up a series from a prior publisher. Uh, you know, I had to go back and re-read re re some of my old John Corey books. But, you know, there's, there's, there's challenges in writing a series. People think it's easy because you it's the same cast of characters, basically. 
but it's not because they're dragging baggage along book by book by book, and they've got to go tell the backstory. You've got to make sure the character sounds consistent. I mean, the internal chronology of, a, of this particular series, and a lot of series, is you know, a matter of years, three or four or five years, but the actual chronology of when, when you're writing them, or they could be 20, 25 years apart. So the character's got to sound like he's still whatever age he is, in this case in his mid-40s, and he's got to make reference to older cases and older, you know, situations, uh, but at the same time not drag the reader down and, uh, and backstories. You know, you, you're assuming that the reader has read all the women in sequence, but that's not true all the time. So uh, you have to make these decisions of how much backstory, and the editor and the author will always have these arguments of how much of the series do you tell in the new uh, the new release? So you know it is a challenge, and he's got to he's got to be consistent. And you know you change as a writer over twenty twenty five years. And the character is supposed to be sort of frozen in time. He's you know forever forty three years old, uh, forty four. So you know it's it's kind of fun in a way, but it's also kind of a challenge in another way. <laughs> So then what's unique about this book? I mean, you mentioned the new publisher as well, compared to the rest of the series. It's been a long series so far. Yeah, good question. Uh, out of the eight books, only one other uh, dealt with a real situation, an historical situation, and that was called Nightfall. And that was about the TWA 800 crash that happened off Long Island. And uh, that was a challenge, too. It's always a challenge when you... Uh, taking a real incident or a real historical event and trying to fictionalize it. Uh, the rest of the Corey books are, um, you know, made up uh, whodunit. Um, he's a um, he's a cop, former NYPD homicide, who is um, on disability from bullet wounds, but he does work for the federal government as a contract agent with the Anti-Terrorist Task Force. So a lot of my books are uh, about terrorism um, and the Thing about Corey, he's a, he's a New York cop who wants to get to the get to the heart of these matters immediately. Uh, but he's working in the anti-terrorist task force with the FBI, who have a different worldview and a different way of doing things. And there's always a clash of cultures. So um, that was the that was the, the thing that kind of drove the book. Corey always clashing with his bosses, that type of thing. Uh, and again, with Nightfall uh, being based on a true incident, I did a lot of research uh, about the TWA 800. And then I uh, said to myself, I'll never do this again. That's such a challenge. But the Gilgo Beach murder so fascinated me that I decided to give it another shot. And uh, so Corey is, you know, back investigating something that actually happened. And, uh, you know, at the end, uh, John Corey gets his man. And this is now your 22nd hardcover book. So what pushes you to continue writing as much as you do? Uh, what pushes me to continue writing? Well, I have a 15-year-old son uh, who, uh, who probably uh, needs some uh, financial support as he gets older. Right. Um, I, you know, it's, uh, I think what it is is, uh, and it's flattering in a way, I, I keep getting offered contracts by publishers, you know, if you think you're redundant or you've already passed your prime, and I'm in my 70s, uh, you know, somebody comes along and says, you know, my agents, we'd like to assign this guy to a three-book contract, uh, you know, you're flattered. So you say, uh, you yeah, know, well, maybe it's not time to retire. Maybe I should do another three. problem is there with a lot of writers uh, – is that you don't know when you're at the top of your game, which which is the exact time you're supposed to quit. But you don't know when that is. And I know writers, and you do too, who have kind of gotten not better as the years went by. Uh, so you know, that's a real challenge, too, to stay at the top of your game and uh, walk away when you think you've done it all. I'm in now my third book of a three-book contract, not this one, but the one I'm writing now. Um, and I, I think maybe that's it, but you never know. We'll see what, we'll see what, no, it's not so much even the publisher and the agent, it's what the reading public wants. This is who I write for, and the fan mail through my website is uh, tremendous, and you know, they all say the same thing. People think of know my age, they say, don't retire, don't retire, don't retire. 
So, you know, I might, I might be added for another three books after this. So that's what keeps you going. But what inspired you to begin as a writer? Well, what inspired me to begin as a writer? Um, I, you know, I spent three years in college, and then I spent three years in the Army, and I went to Vietnam, and I was a combat infantry leader, and uh, I came back, and I finished college, and like a lot of men who go off to war, I guess especially educated men, uh, you want to write the great American war novel. And, um, you know, my generation, I grew up on, um, you know, James Jones and uh, a lot of the other great World War II writers. And uh, that's what I read as a kid. And they, they were all, you know, uh, they, they all got on to other things beyond the war. But I wanted to write that one great American war novel. And that's what I set out to do. Uh, it never really got published in the way I wanted it. Um, but I did finally, uh, maybe 15 years into my writing, write a book called Word of Honor. That was my first Vietnam book, and then my second was Up Country. So I did write two Vietnam books, and I kind of look back at Vietnam in the 60s. Uh, but that's what compelled me, I think, into the writing process. I didn't even intend to make a, a living out of it or to make a career out of it. I just wanted to get this one book, you know, off my chest, so to speak. And I thought it might be cathartic, and it, and it kind of was, although, again, it was never really published. But I've used pieces of that in my writing since then, and, uh, you know, again, I was out of college and sort of at loose ends, and I said, well, this, uh, this is the time of my life. If I'm ever going to write a novel. This is the time to do it, and I did. All right, and you write your stories, one thing I noticed, longhand on legal pads, the classic pencil and paper writing technique that's kind of gone away a little bit. Do you feel that makes your writing better, or is that more of a comfort thing? Oh, I think it makes your writing better. I, I'm really convinced of that. Um, look, you know, uh, we all learned how to write in the first and second grade with a piece of paper and a pencil that somebody gave us. And uh, I think, you know, it's sort of a direct connection between the brain and the hand. And uh, I'm able to play with it a little bit more like a, like an artist doing a first sketch, second sketch, and I can clean it up. And finally, I give it to somebody. I don't type. So um, I, have, uh, I have a great assistant who knows how to read my handwriting. And she can type. And we used to type it. You know, regular typewriter with carbon paper, but now we're you know, uh, using computer. Uh, so I can play with it a little bit more on the computer. But I, I really feel comfortable with the uh, pen and pencil or, uh, and the uh, and, uh, yellow legal pad. Yeah. And you've had a few of your stories throughout the years become films. You had The General's Daughter, Word of Honor, and worked on May Day. Uh, when a piece of your work is adapted into a visual medium, how special is that? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's you, you become a little bit worried about what they're doing to, um, you know, your book. A lot of writers complain. But, you know, I always say to other writers who are complaining, you don't have to sell it to the movies. Uh, that's a, a decision you made, and you know very well. Uh, and, and every writer has known this since the 1920s, including Fitzgerald. Um, if you really care about your book, being made into the uh, a movie that resembles your book, you know, write the screenplay yourself, um, or just take the check and say thank you, and and walk away from it. Um, you know, with the uh, word of honor, um, it, it wasn't the, the the movie I would have wanted. May Day was a little bit better. A General's Daughter, which was a feature film with John Travolta and Madeline Stowe, was probably the best of the three. Uh, do I have control over it? Not at all. But uh, do they come to me and ask me my opinion on the screenplay? Yes, they do. And I gave them my my opinion on the uh, uh, well, three screenplays, but most of all, General's Daughter. And they took some of my suggestions. And when I was on the set, I spoke to Travolta when we were shooting uh, General's Daughter. And uh, he loved the book, and he had a lot of notes himself. And he was asking me, you know, that's what should say in, because... You can't put everything in. That's the problem. I mean, it takes 16 hours to 20 hours to read a book. But a movie will generally be an hour and a half. So obviously you're losing a lot. And uh, you have to make these decisions. Um, and Travolta, you know, consulted with me as did the producer and the director a little bit. So I had a little bit of input into that. And I think it helped. And 
you, know, you see other movies like um, The Godfather with Mario Puzo. He did write the screenplay. Uh, and then uh, Marathon Man with William Goldman, who was a novelist and a screenwriter. And all the Michael Crichton books, the Andromeda Strain and all of them, Jurassic Park. Uh, he was a screenwriter. And I think those are great movies because the novelist was able to transition into a screenwriter and do a, good, a great screenplay. Uh, so, you know, there's not, most of the time there's a disconnect between the novel, the novelist, and the uh, screenplay. Uh, but with General's Daughter, I was a little closer to it, and I think that's why it was a, a, a huge box office success for Paramount. And lastly, why should people read The Maze? Well, if you like an old-fashioned whodunit, <laughs> The Maze is a good one because, um, you know, in real life we don't know we don't know who the murderer was on the Gilgo Beach murders who murdered 10 uh, sex workers. Um, and my character, Corey, comes into this kind of late. Uh, 10 years have already gone by. And uh, he, um, he, you know, he's the one who's been asked to help on this. And I think the, the way I write it in the first person with John Corey, the reader knows only what John Corey knows. And, you know, the reader comes along for the ride, so to speak, and tries to guess, like in any good who done it, you know, who's the bad guy, who is the murderer. So I think that's that's part of it. The other part is, you know, the idea of um, you know people who are marginal, like sex workers, uh, their lives are as important as anybody else's. If they're murdered, the murderer has to be found, and that's one of the themes of the book. And uh, I think the police, you know, understand that too. Although there's been a lot of criticism of that particular case, Gildo Beach and other cases where sex workers or pimps or anybody are you know, killed or are not solid citizens. It doesn't matter. If somebody murdered them and that person has to be found. I think that's, a, that's an important theme of the book. All right. And is there anything else you would like to add? I know you have a book signing coming up and everything. I have a book signing coming up. Uh, I have several, actually. And... Uh, you know, if you go on my website, NelsonDeMille.net, NelsonDeMille.net, it lists all my appearances in the New York metro area, and uh, I hope to see my readers there. All righty. Well, Nelson, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, everybody, go read the maze. Thank you, John. All righty.